Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales from Outer Space, where I take stories from across the internet and read them for your entertainment. This particular story is called Pillars of Warfare, written by Nemo404. The Four Pillars of Warfare were a deeply rooted conflict doctrine concept adopted by virtually every species with something worth bringing to the table. Each species had something akin to a strong suit and an Achilles heel when comparing those pillars to the equivalent ones of their friends or foes. And even when the differences was not that significant, when the burning will of the fighters alongside the ingenuity of the generals would ultimately set winners apart from losers. Those four pillars were still the cornerstones from which strategies would be drawn and plans would be laid. The first pillar was the economy. The ul ul was a species known throughout the galaxy as one to have mastered this concept to perfection, followed closely by a handful of its allied species. It was not as if the rest of the galactic community was unable to see the importance of mass producing and sharing resources in wartime, nor they failed to realize the potential of economic sanctions on a dragged out war. But the subtleties and nuances required to forge strong interspecies friendships capable of withstanding the unforgiven trials of the turbulent times, were just not everyone's cup of tea. The second pillar was technology. As they were called by the few species aware of their existence, the primordials were the indisputable leaders on this front. Even though they had never shown much interest in joining the galactic community, very few would dare to use numbers to try and claim any of their colonies. Their high-precision jump drives and AI-powered drone ships easily made up for the thousands of years of economic stagnation and relentless unwillingness to pursue further expansion of their empire. The third pillar was logistics. The Zip Nunans, notorious for the cheap modular shipyards that could be built on demand at any place with access to basic resources, in addition to their unbreakable supply chain and large-scale transport of personal capabilities were a perfect example of not only how to use logistics to win a war, but also how to profit from the conquered afterwards. Additionally, it was noteworthy to mention that their abundance of non-essential supplies and specialized ships for health service support were rumored to have lifted the morale of their troops enough to have won them more than one single war. The fourth pillar was the strategy. The Arcox whole culture had always revolved around comparing their strengths and weaknesses against the other members of their society. So it came as no surprise to the rest of the galaxy when their generals revealed that they had no particular doctrine about ship formations and battlefield positioning. They would always have already collected more than enough information about their targets before starting any battle and have already chosen the best positioning, attack, defense, and retreating tactics based on their take on how their current enemies would fare against the state of the art of their technology. Those four old species had always had a special place in the Federation ideology, and directly or indirectly helped to shape its accumulated pile of millennial old traditions, rituals and customs that firmly held this institution together against the trial of time. In its conception, the Federation had been established to mediate conflict and cast light on growing anarchy lurking in the shadows of the old galaxy. But slowly and steadily it amassed more responsibilities, such as guiding new species and even uplifting others deemed unable to achieve FTO independently. Every time a new species was found, it was the Federation's duty to ensure that some other older species wouldn't attempt to take advantage of their, if any, new technologies or explore the uniqueness of their biomes to make a profit before the locals figure out how to do so themselves. And that worked perfectly every time without ever an old species twisting the rules in their favor, promoting chaos for their own gain, conspiring with each other to cover up their wrongdoings, or the majority of inert voting members conniving with all of that to avoid creating a trouble for themselves. Or at least that was the formal answer, stripped of all fluff that the Terran ambassador received after he expressed his concerns to the Federation's High Council and demanded a mediatory audience on behalf of his species. The subject matter of this proposed audience was an uncharacteristic accusation that the Zox, an old species selected to guide the recently introduced Terrans, were making things hard for the humans on purpose and acting under the shadows to seed chaos in the deliberate escalation of localized conflicts with the sole goal 
of justifying a future war against the new species. To the Terrans, it was obvious that the Zox had their own agenda and were trying to initiate a generalized conflict with them. The only thing that was not clear at the moment was their motivation. To the rest of the galactic community, however, it was hard to believe that the Zox would do that. Sure, when first introduced to the Federation, the Zox had proven themselves to be prone to violent tendencies against the weak, but they were quick to weed off that behavior from their society in an attempt to improve their relationship with other species. And while they kept some of their vigor and pride intact, the last war they had fought had been more than 300 of their cycles prior to their meeting with the humans. Moreover, from their perspective of the older species, there was not much for the Zox to gain in picking a fight with the humans. Their home system was not particularly rich in resources, and their technology was not particularly impressive either. In their view, the only redeeming quality of this new species was the fact that they apparently already had a solid grasp of the four pillars of warfare, and they had figured it out on their own before having been introduced to the Federation. But it was not like this would do much difference in case of a war against the Zox. No matter how good the species foundation was on the four concepts, if they hadn't had enough time to develop, the prospect of the bright future could not make up for the deficiencies in the present. That was the cruel reality. Humanity was doomed. That was the unspoken agreement of the galactic community at the Terran's predicament when the Zox openly declared what the humans had been frustratingly trying to prove for some time. They wanted war. What they had achieved less consensus about, however, was the motivation of the Zox. Using logic alone, the best move to profit from the Terrans was to play the nice guy and actively encourage their expansion on the surface, and then buying the rights to the exploration of their neighboring systems in secrecy, only to sell it back to them later for a steep price. That was how they could have strengthened one of their pillars without foolishly damaging another two. If only the Zox had acted along these lines, the Terrans might have become a reliable ally of the Federation in a few centuries. But no, that was not the path they had chosen. Their irrational decision of deciding war against the new species and calling forth the last mediation, a millennial old tradition that definitely was not the kind of mediation the Terrans were hoping to get from the Federation, caught many of the members on the High Council unprepared. But they still managed to assemble their fleet in a hurry and somehow arrive with the ambassadors at the agreed planet before the worst happened. The last mediation required a lot of effort from all members of the Federation. Both species, the Terran and the Zox, were required to bring their full fleet and display it on opposite sides of the planet, while the remaining members should use their collective superiority to ensure that no fight would occur. That might seem like a silly tradition or a dangerous stance that would only waste time and resources, but the last mediation was meant to put into perspective the strengths and weaknesses of both sides and possibly convince the weaker to give up without a fight, even if they were offered terrible terms of surrender. Something the galactic community unanimously believed the humans would do, given their overwhelmingly unfavorable circumstances. That's why it came as an absolute surprise to the reporters of various races when the Terran ambassador utterly ignored them upon landing in his modest ship and, without taking any detour, strode towards the dome where the last mediation would take place. From their perspective, the Terrans' best shot of getting out of this quagmire was to appeal to the goodwill of other races and seek refuge somewhere else, while the Zox conquered a few worlds they possessed. But no, the Terran ambassador's stern countenance and the imposing bearing of the surprisingly few soldiers who followed him from behind were diametrically opposed stance that sensible species would expect from someone in a dire need for help. A wave of whispers and other species-specific equivalents spread like a contagious disease between the isolated alcoves that kept the ideal living conditions for the numerous representatives. When the high speaker announced that the Terran ambassador had arrived and the last mediation would commence, the rumor that had originated from the landing site had been proven to be true. The Terrans had not taken advantage of the spotlight to ask for refuge. Under the scrutiny of many eyes and other less conventional sensory organs, both the Terran and the Zox ambassadors climbed the ladder leading to the podium at the center of the dome from opposite sides. Upon arriving at their assigned positions, 
the high speaker announced from the center. It is unfortunate that we are all gathered here under the present circumstances. The Zocks have declared war against the Terrans and demanded unconditional surrender as the sole condition for peaceful resolution of the conflict. The Terrans had not agreed to this condition, and therefore we shall measure pillar against pillar and strength against weakness in a last attempt to show reason to the unreasonable and avoid any unnecessary loss of sapient life. The Zox representative took a step forward and unsheathed her long claws while sizing up the physically weak human not far away from him. No one could deny that the Zox looked scary with a bulky bipedal build and sharp claws, even if all that was meaningless in space warfare. In a clear attempt to show dominance, he took the lead and spoke first, but without breaching protocol. Give up, human. Our economy alone orders of magnitude greater than yours, and we can produce more ships in any given day than your species did in your previous full cycle. It wasn't a surprise to anyone that the Zox ambassador had used so few words to describe the complexity of his species' economy. But the fact that the human ambassador had used even less in his reply was truly unbelievable. We are aware of that. The lack of statement regarding how the Terran economy fared against the Zox was a clear breach of protocol. Refusing to give a statement in this formal gathering was akin to a slap in the face of all species that had gone to great lengths to ensure this instance of the last mediation would succeed. Of course, given that the Terrans were a new species, many delegates would cut them some slack. But that blunder wouldn't look good in the luminosity sensor organs of the neutral species of the Federation. The Zox ambassador's eyes became sharp and his voice betrayed his excitement at his opponent's mistake as he went on without breaching protocol. Now technology surpasses that of you, the humans, in all possible areas, and our simulations show that one of our ships can easily take down more than ten of those ancient vessels the humans call <laughs> spaceships. A thick atmosphere of judgmental anticipation permeated the dome as delegates waited for another blunder from the human ambassador. This time, however, the Terran ambassador was offered a proper statement. We are aware of that as well. That is why we have stopped the production of new ships altogether in the past year to focus the attention of our engineers on uh, something more important. A gaze from the human ambassador was the cue the backstage personnel was waiting for to project the 3D image of the three immensely long constructions comprised of a myriad of lined-up rings that seemed to be a part of an endless line that disappeared from sight on both sides. A wave of surprise spread amongst the delegates at the ludicrous sight of the mysterious construction being projected over the central stage. These are three makeshift modular coil guns that our scientists came up with after we realized the evil intention of those who were supposed to guide us through the ins and outs of the Federation. Each set of a hundred rings has a jump station attached to it, making it a perfect weapon for first strike. You all may think that something that big would take a lot of time to assemble and fire, but no. Since each module is independent, the whole structure can leave hyperspace anywhere in the galaxy and fire an antimatter projectile at the speed close to that of light in just a few seconds. We know that we can't compete with the Zox in regards to technology, but a big enough trebuchet can demolish even a modern building. It's just a matter of size, after all. A cacophony ensued amongst the delegates, and it only intensified when the translator finished explaining what was a trebuchet to those species that were not familiar with its concept. Even though most of them were not familiar with the kind of weapon shown by the human ambassador, they were more than able to understand the implication of a lump of antimatter being accelerated to relativistic speeds just after leaving hyperspace. There was just no defending against such a weapon. The Zox ambassador could barely believe this was happening, and he knew that he could not passively allow the tides to shift against his species, or rather, against him, as he saw the resistance as a personal attack on his pride as a prince. There was no way that a backward species such as those humans could force his people, and by extension himself, to take a step back. 
Under such a train of thought, he remembered a couple of details from the last intelligence report that he'd received before the formal declaration of war. Such big guns for a species that can't even produce enough ammunition for it. I would be worried if there was a structure capable of converting the energy of your star into antimatter. But with your only planet factories, I doubt that you have enough of it to fire your weapon more than once. That is if the whole thing doesn't blow itself up before firing, of course. The human ambassador retorted with such an expectancy of avoiding a war stamped on his face that the feeling managed to break the interspecies barrier and reached the hearts of some of the delegates. Three shots and three planets of our choice. Isn't that enough for your family to give up this war? The Zox ambassador was livid at his family being sighted instead of his species and doubled down instead of giving up. Don't compare your species with mine. We can afford to lose three planets. We have more than a hundred colonies spread between multiple systems. At worst, we lose some nobles and a couple billions of useless peasants. The delegates who originally had come to the dome with no expectation of any excitement were barely able to keep up with the conversation, as both ambassadors on stage deliberated on the ramifications of their new variable introduced by the Terrans. When the shock from the Zox ambassador's last sentence hit them, the high speaker was already announcing that the request for a recess had been accepted in accordance with the will of the human ambassador. The human looked quite dejected as he left the podium without entertaining the inquiring looks coming from the alcoves. None of them blamed him for his attitude this time around, though. The humans had laid down a perfect plan for ending this war, only to have it torn down by the Zox's sheer stubbornness. About an hour went by in the blink of an eye as the delegates lost themselves in heated debates about the reason why the Zox would go to such lengths to go to war with the new species. What kind of profit or offense was so great that it would be worth losing three planets over? Before any meaningful conclusion could have been reached, the High Speaker announced the continuation of the last mediation. Silence propagated steadily as the thickness of the atmosphere grew by a whole order and magnitude as both ambassadors returned to their assigned positions. This time, there was a significant doubt if the humans would surrender or choose a path of mutual destruction, where the Zox would lose about ten times more lives for each human death, but would still win the war just by having more numbers. The Zox ambassador took the lead once more, but this time he was much more serious about describing the logistical capabilities of his species. Five million ships can warp to Earth at any time. We can defeat your fleet in about 30 minutes in your time units. We can raise your cities to the ground and establish hundreds of outposts on Earth and your other colonies within a day. Our infantry can crush any resistance on the ground within a week, and we can supply them with large amounts of weapons on demand. Within a month, billions of tons of construction material of better quality than anything that you can hope to produce will be used by the settlers of my race to rise statues to the honor and glory of the royal family who took control of your planets and achieved victory against such a weak species. The pitiful gazes of the delegates tried without success to gauge the mood of the human ambassador. Since he had returned to the podium, he had not once raised his head as he mechanically waited for his counterpart to finish his long and pretentious speech about the near future. For someone in your position, you speak of the future a lot, don't you? Again, the human ambassador's cold and detached tone crossed the interspecies barrier causing an ominous chill to be felt by some delegates. But allow me to do the opposite and speak of the past. The human reached out into his inner pocket and took out a thin touchscreen tablet. This is a portable media device that my species had been producing for hundreds of years, now dated technology, even by our standards. This model has been mass-produced using nothing but cheap materials, but the screen is still good enough to not be scratched by the claws of your kind for a few hours. Not that it would be a problem long term, since a battery is non-rechargeable anyway. The delegates exchanged looks of pity, thinking that the human had gone crazy by the pressure of the situation. 
while the Zox ambassador took the device as a half-hearted attempt of the Terrans of offering his species that thing as a souvenir of surrender and the hopes of getting better treatment in the near future. The human ambassador ignored all of that and went on, an hour ago, all of our merchant ships managed to deliver millions of containers full of these devices to all the peasants of your planets at the same time. Isn't that a great feat of logistics? About 30 minutes ago, a good chunk of your population had seen a video describing human weapons and also of you saying that your species could afford to lose a few planets. And guess what it was followed by? A video of humans saying that their planets had been the chosen ones for our attack. But that's not all there is to the story. My fellow human also said they still had a chance of survival. That if in case they just killed all of the nobles on the planet, we would forgive them and spare the planet. All of that was followed by a countdown and a map to the closed target, with an ominous soundtrack to remind them that their time was running out. A culturally specific one, of course. The human ambassador delivered each of these sentences with such intonation that the Zox Prince immediately pictured the scenario of mass hysteria taking place in the many planets of his empire. It was so clear that he almost could touch it. Every piece of the puzzle made sense. The merchant ships entering the planet and taking advantage of the lack of security caused by his fleet attending the last mediation in its entirety. The peasants, who were mostly unsatisfied with the nobles and lacked proper education, believing humans and rebelling at once. The nobles, who were too complacent with the status quo not having enough security to protect themselves. Every piece fitted so perfectly that it was scary. Confusion. Panic unacceptance. Before the delegates could fully understand the implications of what the humans had done, the Zox ambassador shouted angry, The rules! Those animals broke the rules! During the last mediation, it's forbidden to attack the other. They all should be punished by the Federation. A transgression of this level can be punished with nothing but extermination. His loud voice and serious accusation caused a brief pause amongst the delegates, then pandemonium broke loose, and all semblance of order was forgotten. It took more than just a single fake cough to capture back their attention, but eventually the human ambassador was able to speak on behalf of humanity. We've done nothing against the rules. All of our military fleets are still orbiting this planet, and not a single gun had been fired against the Zox. If there is a rebellion happening on their planets, it's because their citizens do not agree with the war declared by their rulers. The Zox ambassador was struggling to calm down and prepared a series of good arguments to prove his point. The high speaker was faster. No rule has been broken, and therefore no punishment shall be inflicted on the humans. The high speaker was aware that he was witnessing a moment that would go down in the history of the Federation. So he tried his best to hide his apprehension and awe and do his job properly in the face of this paradigm-shifting warfare tactics the Terrans had just employed. The last mediation shall proceed as intended. There is nothing to continue. This war is over now. The Zox ambassador was furious. He scanned the delegates below with such intensity that some prey species nearly fainted on the spot, while a few predators amongst them took a step back out of reflex. Finally, his dismissive eyes rested on the human. I have a rebellion to contain, but don't think for a second that this matter is over. I am not opposed to you leaving now, if you wish to do so, but allow me to give you a piece of unsolicited advice before you go. As he spoke, the human ambassador's eyes never met Zox, and instead faced the delegates below. Your species, like uh, many others here, walked a long path in understanding and perfecting space war and its variants, and yet you still lost today. You lost more than what you know. You lost a war. You lost a kingdom. You lost the loyalty of your generals, and you also lost your life. You just don't know that yet. We know that your family sought this war because of a need of a foreign enemy to justify the lack of resources and care given to your own population. And we know that the nobles were thrilled to lead their shining ships to conquer a distant foe in remembrance of a nostalgic past of glory. 
All we did was see through your plan and react accordingly. But back to the topic of your life. It was not our intention to kill you today. It just happens that our communications officers in orbit were not pleased with all the harassment and threats that were coming from the captains of your ships. So they broadcasted some images of what was happening to their families back at Zox Empire. Well, they were stuck here for the last mediation because of you. My advice for you is to stay in the storm as long as you can, because it just takes a single trigger-happy captain or some power-hungry noble to order an orbital strike on the ship of an unwanted monarch. The human ambassador then proceeded to leave the podium without even addressing the mess his speech left behind. To this day, many historians still try to piece together what happened behind the scenes that day. Some say that the Zox ambassador was afraid to leave and followed the advice of the human for as long as he could. Others say he threw a foot and was arrested by security after trying to kill the human representative. The only thing that is certain is that his ship blew up later in the upper atmosphere and the laser that hit it was fired from somewhere within his own fleet. This alongside other casualties in the royal family caused the Zox monarchy to fall apart and their empire to implode in a complex process that some members of the Federation barely understand. But the humans surprisingly had a word for it. Balkanization. The Terrans never formally left the Federation, but refused to participate in meetings or apply to any communications attempts. The three modular coil guns were never used in battle, but served as a great deterrent that allowed the humans enough time to develop their own technologies. Late attempts were made to bring the Terrans back as active members of the Federation, but when they had developed enough to have nothing to fear from us, it also meant that they had nothing to gain from us. In the end, just like the older species, they ended up following their own path, but not without leaving a legacy behind. Another pillar had been established, and the term information warfare was now known throughout the galaxy. End of story. I would just quickly like to thank the T5 peeps, Dragon Soup, Cold War Boomerwaffen, Severin Cerberus, Red Panda 121, Leslie 517, Bushmaster 177, Caspar Arnholtz, Cam Maxwell, Sans the Skeleton, Lightjock, Dragzoon WRE, and Lord Azrakal. Thank you very much.